Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Um, we have been uh, implementing a more full 3D pipeline for the game, uh, which allows Z to be handled by the back end so we can use things like a Z buffer. Previously we handled everything like that uh, at the head end and only fed the graphics card or our software renderer perfectly sorted things that were already ready to draw and it didn't have to do uh, any work like that. Uh, but we've decided to go to a Z buffer because I thought there were too many drawbacks with the other approach. Uh, and so that's what we're doing right now. We've done the work of moving the projection code over to OpenGL's uh, transform matrices as a first step in making sure that that stuff works correctly. Uh, but we still have a little bit more work to do in terms of actually getting ourselves to the point where we are able to use that uh, as an actual able to use that actual system. So before we get too far down that path of trying to debug and trying to get working a system that uses the Z buffer for doing our sorting, uh, I decided last time on stream that what I wanted to do was have a way of rotating the camera around in three dimensions, not because we actually need this in the game for any particular reason, but actually just because what we do need to do is be able to, for debug purposes, see what things actually look like geometrically when we're trying to figure out what we may have done wrong uh, when we're debugging things. Because we're going to have bugs uh, as we try to work in 3D, and we need ways of inspecting what's going on to give ourselves more information about what the bugs are. Right? So what I wanted to do. Uh, is I just wanted to go ahead and build some code that would allow us to rotate the camera around and be able to see the world geometry from different angles, e even though it's flat, uh, being able to see exactly how those flat pieces were lined up and how they were stacked on top of each other and stuff like that, just to give us some greater insight, basically, into what was going on. So that's what we're doing. Uh, today is day 362, so you want to unpack day 361 source code if you're trying to follow along at home. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and open up the project here. Oops. There we go. Uh, and I am going to show where we're at. Uh, you can see here we are now running through OpenGL's uh, projection, and everything is working just fine, except for the fact that obviously, uh, because we took sorting out of the mix, uh, we no longer run the sort, and so everything is just flashing like crazy. The reason it's flashing like crazy uh, is because the order in which we send down entities changes every frame. Uh, and since without having enabled the Z buffer, uh, we end up in a situation where we don't actually uh, have any stable order that these things are drawn in. So they're drawn in a random order. Uh, and very specifically, that is, is what we are actually going to be fixing by switching to a Z buffer as well. right? We've removed the sort, but now we need to put the Z buffer in uh, to do that. But again, before we get to trying to make that work properly, because uh, that's going to require us sending down uh, things in a, in a particularly in a, sent to constructing our sprite cards, basically, in a very specific way, you'll see uh, is necessary to make sure that that works properly. Before we get into that business, I want the ability to view the world from multiple angles because I want to be able to debug it, basically. Uh, and we probably want this code anyway because we may find, you know, I don't know, but we may find that we want different angles for the game. You know, we may, uh, we may want to run the game straight top down, uh, but we may want to run the game slightly tilted. You know, we have to see what looks better. Uh, so having the camera rotation code in there is probably just a good idea in general because it allows us to experiment with that in terms of the look of the game as well. And we don't know up front uh, which exact way is, is going to be our preferred way. So having that rotation ability is kind of nice uh, for that reason as well. So let's go ahead and switch up here uh, and, uh, and take a look at where, where we had started on this stuff. Now, hopefully you remember everything from last week because it took a long time to go over, uh, so I can't really go over it again. So I'm just going to assume that you remember all of the stuff that we did uh, with these matrices here. And there was only one thing that I didn't really talk about with the matrices. Uh, I talked about how to multiply them. I talked about how to make a rotation matrix. And we made three uh, of the rotation matrices for the cardinal angles. And uh, we talked about having to transpose matrices so that they uh, would be able to um, uh, pass through OpenGL properly, because OpenGL by default takes non-transpose matrices unless you call the transpose versions of the call. 
Uh, it, when we get to shaders, we'll be able to, we'll have a little bit more flexibility there, as you'll see, uh, but that's a separate issue. Anyway, uh, and then of course we have our projection matrix construction, and our projection matrix right now is very simple, uh, but it works, right? It does the exact same operation that we were doing previously in the main game code for producing the um, coordinates for the XY coordinates, and we verified that by producing the same game screen, basically, that we were getting before. So. Uh, we pretty much know that we've got that under control, but now let's take a look at these rotation matrices, uh, talk about what's supposed to happen here in order to get our camera doing what I suggested that I want to do, uh, and talk a little bit more about the other aspects here, because we've got to uh, talk about the translation portion, uh, which again is not very complicated, but uh, we did just to mention it, and then also the idea of composing matrices together. All right. Uh, so first of all, let's just talk very, very briefly about what we need to do and about translation matrices. And then we'll talk about why matrix uh, concatenation works properly uh, so that you can kind of understand a little bit more specifically uh, why that is the case. All right. Um, so let's talk about matrix multiplication. <clears throat> OK. So you've seen me do it a couple times before, just in terms of like sort of sketching it out or mentioning it. But we've never really dived into detail, and we've never really used it extensively in the code at all for any particular reason. Uh, but we basically had a, you know, have had things where we talked about, and I think I guess what I did is I think I said C uh, equals A, B um, is sort of, I think, what I wrote the other day, which is just to say that you know, I was just mentioning the fact uh, that we have this idea that if we have all of these matrices, if we have A and B, for example, uh, we can use matrix multiplication, which is denoted by putting the two matrices together symbolically. This is how it's written, much like uh, scalar multiplication is written by putting the two variables next to each other in math notation. Obviously, in computer notation, uh, we put a star in between them. Um, so they're a little bit different there, but still uh, Hopefully, everyone understands uh, math notation well enough to see where that comes from. Uh, so when we say C equals AB, what we're saying is that there is some way to produce a matrix C uh, by multiplying a matrix A and a matrix B. And what we did last time on the stream is I showed how to produce the matrix C from matrix A and B. Uh, and hopefully, that was very clear. But what might not be very clear from that is what it does or why you want to use it. right? Uh, because I said that what it does is it produces a combined transform, right? Um, but I didn't really say how it was doing that or why it was doing that. And it's relatively important not to treat things in programming like black boxes that you don't understand because oftentimes when you're trying to do uh, intricate things or new things or develop new algorithms, it's crucial that you be able to understand how things are working at a fundamental level because otherwise you will miss important opportunities uh, and be unable to solve bugs and, and have all other sorts of problems because you don't really know what's going on. Whereas really knowing what's going on allows you to analyze the complete um, uh, workings of a program and make important improvements to it, uh, make new algorithms, or find difficult to find bugs. Uh, so basically, the combined algorithm, <coughs> sorry, the combined matrix is produced by doing matrix multiplication. And the question is, what does that mean? What does it mean to combine two uh, transforms? And why are they combined in the way that I will, will explain uh, they are combined? So first of all, let me start by just stating what actually happens here for people who don't know or aren't familiar with it. Uh, in math notation, we typically have written something, and I think you've seen me write it this way before. Uh, I'll do something like a times b times p equals c times p, right? And it's sort of saying, like, OK, if we were going to take a point and we're going to transform it by these two matrices somehow, uh, then this matrix C would do the same transform to the point. right? And so what we could g glean from this right, is that some definition of the transform that happens when I transform by B and A uh, is represented by C. Now, the first question might be, uh, is it always order independent? Or you know, does if I say CP equals ABP, right, um, what does that say about CP uh, 
and BAP, for example, right? Because one thing that we know from scalar multiplication is that if I was to write the scalar version of this, right? If I was to write C equals AB, we know that that also equals BA in straight scalar multiplication in a normal scalar space like the kind we work in in high school algebra, right? So what we would first possibly think if we were just trying to extend our understanding of multiplication directly from scalar multiplication, we would probably think that these were going to be equal to each other, right? And that we could just say that AB and BA, well, it just does both transforms. It doesn't matter what order they're in. Um, that is true in certain circumstances, depending on the structures of the matrices. Uh, but it is not true in other circumstances. Matrix multiplication is actually order dependent. Uh, and the reason that it is order dependent is because you produce a different set of products depending on which order you put the matrices. And you can actually see this uh, by doing it yourself. If you made a matrix A, B, C, D like this, uh, and then make another matrix uh, I, J, K, L, right, or something like this, um, and I was to multiply these two together, we all know what we would get. Uh, even if we just were uh, looking at the first term of this matrix, we would end up with IJ, right? And uh, I'm sorry, AI in this case, uh, plus BK, right? Uh, and then this, uh, you know, we'd get product over here, product over here. And then the, in the next row down, we would get, and this is just what we did yes, yes, uh, last time on the stream, right? For those of you who missed it, you want to go back and watch that. We'd know we'd get these two terms here, right? But if I was going to flip the order of these around, so same exact matrices, but I'm just going to multiply them in the opposite order here, right? So here I've got this matrix times this matrix. Here I've got them opposite, right? This matrix, and I'm going to multiply it by this matrix here. You can see immediately that we get um, uh, completely different terms, right? We get an AI, and that's in common, but then right away we get a different term here. It's a CJ term, right? And the CJ term uh, previously uh, would not have occurred in this column at all, right? It was a CI term is where, where that showed up. Uh, and similarly, when we get to the next one, same thing. We get an AK um, plus a CL term here, right? And you can see that K is nowhere to be found in terms of, a, of an A term here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and yeah, I mean, you get the idea, right? It's like, it's very obviously a different set of products. I, I guess I don't need to belabor that point. So because of that, uh, when we do matrix multiplication, we must be very mindful of the order because as you can see, only through extreme happenstance, when these matrices happen to have very specific structure that just so happens to lead them to produce the same products uh, in those places, will we get uh, the same results. Uh, you know, one example would be if the matrix was diagonal, for example, uh, if there were no terms on the outsides of these, right? So if there were just zeros all through here, uh, then what we get is something very akin to scalar multiplication because the diagonals always line up in the same place, right? So we would get AI here and we would get AI here again because we always have that product uh, of the diagonal appearing down the diagonal in the result, right? So if everywhere else is zero and you just have diagonal matrices, then the order ceases to matter uh, in most cases because the diagonal products line up, right? No matter which way you do it. Uh, and hey, you know what's kind of interesting about that, just as an aside, uh, what does it, is a matrix that just has terms down the diagonal, right? Uh, well, that is a scaling matrix. Right? You remember we talked about these a long time ago. If I have an xy that's coming in here, a point I'm multiplying by, uh, then that's just ax, by. It's just a scale on the incoming thing. It's two coefficients uh, that scale the incoming thing. What do we know about scaling? Well, scaling as a transform is order independent. If I make something twice as large and then I make it four times large again, it's just eight times larger. Same is true if I make something four times larger and then two times larger again still eight times larger, right? Uh, and so one of the interesting, really kind of fascinating things about matrices, uh, and again, why, you know, I, mathematically speaking, historically, uh, you can see why they were relevant to solving problems and why we started using them to create uh, structure for notating complex systems like this, 
is because that actually captures something true about the operation. Scaling is order dependent. I'm sorry, order independent. You can scale in any order and it doesn't matter. And the math also captures that. Similarly, things that do matter order-wise, for example, rotation. Rotation in three dimensions is order dependent. It matters which order you do the rotations in. In matrix math, it actually happens that that order dependence is preserved properly. And so they're very pr powerful tools in that sense in that they capture mathematically the same things that occur in the real world, and that's very important. Uh, so now let's take a look at why the order uh, dependence is important for us and how it captures the transform dependence. Like I said, something like scaling that's only diagonal, it doesn't have any order dependence, and that's exactly what we want. But for something like rotation, we do want uh, that to capture that order uh, dependence because with rotations, uh, because they are not um, a clean Euclidean operation, uh, what you end up having is if you rotate something one way and then from that point do a, a rotation again in the, you know, if I, if I have a world space rotation this way and then I apply another world rota space rotation this way, it's not the same as if I did the two in the opposite order. It might be sometimes, depending on the choice of axes, it might result in the same thing, but oftentimes it will result in a different final orientation. That's just true about rotations in three dimensions. It has nothing to do with game programming. Um, obviously, we care about in game programming, but it is not a construct. It's not an artificial construct. That's just actually how uh, real three-dimensional objects behave uh, in the real world. So what happens with matrix multiplication is, remember, I talked quite a bit uh, about the uh, concept that in a matrix, uh, you can have the x, uh, the y, and the z axes uh, of the space you're talking about, they go in the columns of the matrix, uh, corresponds to placing something in the world uh, at that x, y, and z axis reference frame, right? Uh, so, you know, we've got something that looks uh, like this, let's say, where I've got a y axis, an x axis, and a z axis. Uh, and you can see here in my matrix, I would put the three values for the z axis here, I would put the three for the y down here, and the three for the x down here. We talked about this quite a bit. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is when a, um, if these are my axes, let's say, uh, and I've got a px, py, pz uh, for my point that comes in, the reason for that is, of course, this produces this equation, p um, x, ax, py, ay, pz, az, which is just reinterpreting the point p along these axes, right? It's saying go the x coordinate, go that far along the x axis. The y coordinate go that far along the y axis. The z coordinate go that far along the z axis, right? So it makes perfect sense why that works with a point transform. Uh, so now the next question is, well, if it makes perfect sense with a point transform, though, why does it work for putting two rotations together, let's say, or a rotation and a scale together? Uh, well, you can see quite easily why a rotation and a scale would work, right? Because the same thing applies here. If I have a matrix that's a rotation, here's my rotation matrix, and then I have a rotation, uh, I mean a matrix that's a scale. Here's my SX, um, that's a lowercase s. Uh, I know it's hard to tell uh, because there's no difference between that and an uppercase s, but it's supposed to be, uh, right? Then what you're gonna see happen here is, you know, when I create the product, uh, when I look at the SX, well, what's going to go, you know, in this, in this part here? Well, it's just going to be whatever the X coordinate of the X axis is times SX. The same will be true for each one of these, right? The Y coordinate will just be times um, uh, uh, of, of the AX axis will just be times the SX, right? Because the SX will just multiply everything in this column, right? And the SY multiplies everything in the next column and so on, right? So what we end up with is the exact same structure of the matrix, but just now every column has been multiplied by the scale that we were trying to apply, right? And so what that means is that we have applied the scaling matrix to the columns of the rotation matrix, uh, which are the axes of the rotation, right? Which produces exactly what we want. A reference frame that, you know, if it used to look like this, now it looks like a scaled version of that, which is exactly what we were trying to do, right? 
We were trying to rotate and scale. Well, now we have a matrix which does both, right? It produced exactly those axes, which are the rotation axes scaled by the scale we were trying to apply, right? So that's a pretty easy combination there. Same thing is true, but it's a little harder to see because there's just a lot more numbers involved. Scale is nice because it just goes down the diagonal. It's really simple to see. Um, but if I had the same sort of situation where I've got an AX, an AY, uh, and an AZ, uh, and then up here I've got another matrix that's a BX, a BY, and a BZ, uh, then again, we sort of can see uh, in this case, that we're going to have a combination of these values, but without dropping the scalar, it's pretty difficult to understand uh, how these things combine, right? Uh, it's like, well, okay, I, I've got an axis here, and I, you know, I've got an axis here. What exactly is happening there? It's like I'm not sure, right? The, the x coordinate of bx is multiplying uh, AX the whole way down, right? Uh, but then the Y coordinate of BX is also multiplying uh, AY the whole way down, right? And it's like, wait, what's going on? Uh, well, we can drop the scalar and just do it out. But I would also encourage you, and, and hopefully at this point, if you want to do that, you can go do that on your own. And you've seen me do mace multiplication so many times on Handmade Hero, you should be, have it pretty cold. Uh, so you should be able to do it. Um, but if you just think about this briefly, remember that matrix multiplication and vector multiplication are exactly the same thing, right? What did we say last week about the columns of the matrix that's on the right hand of the multiplication? So if we're doing A times B, what did we say about the columns of this, right? <clears throat> we said it could have as many as it wants. <coughs> Excuse me. And why can it have as many as it wants? Well, because we go columns in B for producing a term and rows in A, which means that to produce the entire one entire row of the output, we have only ever used and consumed one row of B to do so. There is no need for us to ever use this row again. It is irrelevant, right? For the next column, it will never be touched. So essentially, what we can think of is we can think of each of these matrix multiplications, uh, column multiplications, as a separate vector, right? And you already just saw me do that. If I had said AX, AY, AZ were the columns of this matrix, and I said we were multiplying by a point X, Y, Z, right? And this is the point P, here's the matrix A, and this is the equation, you know, P prime equals AP, right? Here's my P prime right here that I'm producing. Well, we know exactly what this is. We just said that this is this vector, right? Not a matrix, but a vector is X AX plus <clears throat> Y BY plus Z, oops, AY plus Z AZ. Right? It's just a point that's made by going x along ax, y along ay, and z along az. Right? That's one column vector. Well, that's exactly what would happen here. Right? It's just bx transformed by a. That's what's going to be produced here. Right? Just like this is a transformed by p. That's what the result is. So we can write the resulting matrix by just saying, hey, this matrix A, it's just A times the BX, right? Like, uh, I don't know what the, probably I should not have used the capital letters for both the vector and the matrix. This was bad notation, uh, but I did, so oh well. It's A times, let's, let's make that a lowercase b, I guess. I don't know. Uh, it's A times, and you know, maybe these are lowercase a's all of a sudden. Pretend that always happened. It's A times the BX vector uh, plus, <clears throat> sorry, A, uh, yeah, A times the BX vector plus, not plus, well, I'm, I'm totally flustered by my, my change to lowercase totally threw me. It's A times BX in the first column. It's A times BY in the second column. And it's A times BZ in the third column, right? 
That's just what we actually produced. <clears throat> and so you can see right away, just from reading that off, now that we've figured out what it was, you can see just by reading it off that that produces the set of axes represented by the matrix B transformed by A. So it's, pr it's applying A as a transform to B, right? And that clues us directly in on the order of, ma of, uh, of interpreting matrix products, right? If I have some big long series here and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna produce something at the end of this, right? Some composite matrix Q or whatever, right? And I've got QP prime is A times B times C times D times E times F times P. And the question is, what order, if I am looking at Q, or even if I'm just looking at this equation, <clears throat> what order are these transforms uh, performed in? You know? And again, if it's something like scaling, I don't care what order it's in. It doesn't matter. But for something like rotation, I do. So assume that these, some of these, at least in here, have a rotation or some other thing, a shear, something that, who's order dependent. What order are they going in, conceptually? And the answer you can see here is that it's always the second term in a product, the, the further to the right, that is the one that's applied first. And it's the one further to the left that's being up done to it, right? It's saying, I start with the F, and that is the first transform that would be applied. I'm going to apply E to F, right? So E is this, then E, D, C, B, A. So if you read left to right, <laughs> right? you're actually reading them in the wrong order of conceptual application. Conceptually, they're actually getting applied this way, right? You start with the thing you're working on and you go backwards from that, uh, and this ends up being the last transform that gets applied. <clears throat> and again, that comes directly from this interpretation here where you can see exactly why that occurs. Now again, that saying that, <clears throat> what order they get applied in, uh, that I'm not trying to speak to some mathematical thing here. What I'm trying to speak to is a conceptual thing. When these transforms are, I'm sorry, when these matrices are representing transforms in 3D, <clears throat> we as humans have a concept of what order the transforms are going in because that is a conceptual thing. And it matters. Like I said, the rotation order matters. <clears throat> so what I'm saying here when I say that they are applied in this order, I'm not trying to talk about a mathematical order of application. What I'm trying to say is when the math is performed as the math is performed by the definition of matrix multiplication, the result conceptually is that the order of transformation, the appearance of how the transform will occur, is in this order. Whereas if you flipped the order, you would get a different resulting transform that was as if the transform had been applied in a different order, right? So there you go. So that's matrix multiplication and, uh, and its effect and why its effect is that way. Now, two more things we have to cover. First, translation. And this one's the easy one. So, translation, we already know how to do it. We do it all the time, right? We take a point, we want to produce a new point that's offset by something, what do we do? Well, we just add an offset, right? So we just have some offset that gets added in here, right? We don't know what it is, um, just some vector, three-dimensional vector, we set it to whatever we want, and that offsets the point, right? So I've got some offset, let's say that offset is A, and in here I want to offset this point by A. Well, then we know that I've got a point P. I've got that uh, A that I could think of as a vector that starts at P and points in some direction and has a length. We end up at P prime, which is just going along there, right? We know exactly what that is. We understand that very well. We do it all the time in Handmade Hero. So now the question is, well, I want to capture that, but in a matrix, because I want to be able to produce these composites here where not only do I have rotation and not only do I have scaling, but I also have position incorporated into that operation, right? So I want the whole thing. 
and so what I can do if I want to do that is I can take advantage of uh, the, the 4 by 4 nature of these matrices. And this is where you start to see that 4 by 4 uh, element come into play. And I mentioned this before uh, on previous stream. If we were to just have uh, an x, right, uh, a y, and a z uh, axes, and this is our 4 by 4 matrix, right? If we were just to have a 3 by 3, which is this upper part here, right? And maybe just because we're doing that, uh, we're, you know, maybe uh, I'll, I'll be a little more explicit just this one time uh, when we're talking about it here. Uh, if we talk about having the x-axis, oops, y-axis, uh, and z-axis, Uh, so if we were to just take this 3 by 3 and pretend the matrix was just 3 by 3, right? Uh, then what you can see from this, and we talked about this before, is that everything that comes in as a point, right? Uh, and let me, maybe, uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that so close to the equation. Let's remove that there. Move it down a little bit. Let's do it right here. All right. Uh, so if we were to have this, and I have an incoming point like this, uh, what you can see from the equation that results uh, is that you never really get an opportunity uh, to put any translation in here. Because when I do this multiplication out, uh, what I will end up getting in each of my uh, components is unfortunately uh, that leaves no room for a translation, right? So my x coordinate of the result is going to be px um, uh, xx plus pyx. I'm sorry, yx uh, plus pz uh, zx, right? That's what we're going to get there. Uh, and similarly, we get the exact same thing uh, in all of these. Uh, oops, it's no good. P x x y P y y y P z z y and finally P z sorry P x x z P y y z P z z z so you can see here, uh, this creates exactly what we wanted in terms of a vector equation for reinterpreting things around rotated or scaled axes. Because you can see how to pull out the px, py, and pz from here. And when we rewrite that, we just get px times that x-axis, right? Plus py times that y-axis plus pz times that z-axis, right? You can see that. The pz is all common here. And we have z, x, y. There's that vector, right? py is common here, right? So this, this just produces exactly this. And that's great for rotation and scaling and shearing and everything else that's just axial manipulation. But the question is, where is the origin, right? The origin hasn't changed at all here. There's no fundamental displacement because every term that we had in our transform is multiplied by something in the input. So there is no offset that just comes in. We need a term over here that's not multiplied by anything in x or y or z, right, in order to get that in there. And so this is where that augmentation to 4 by 4 comes in handy yet again. It was good for the projection for the synthetic divide idea. Uh, and it's also useful here. Uh, because what we pretend when we do these transforms is that our three-dimensional points are augmented by a 1. So we use that fourth coordinate and we stick a 1 in there. And we use that 1 to ensure that we can add something at the end of our matrix multiplication and get a valid uh, translation out of it. So what you can see is that 1 will hit the things 
in each of these positions. So if I have a translation X, translation Y, and a translation Z here, then what'll happen is that will just get tacked onto the end. One times translation X, one times translation Y, one times translation Z, lo and behold, that's just adding the translation vector onto the end, right? And that is what produces the four by four structure for a translation uh, rotation scale shear matrix, right? This part down here is not used because that only comes into play when we actually start needing to do perspective, right? You saw me use it, you saw me use this one when we start to use perspective. So it does come into play, but it's really this part that's the important part for our purposes uh, when we're talking about 3D transforms. We don't need any of this down here most of the time. And in fact, a lot of people, when they implement pipelines, just implement just this part and they hard code all of the multiplication to assume 0, 0, 0, 1 on the bottom. And they only have uh, stuff that takes care of the bottom when they actually use, uh, when they actually go to do perspective. Like at the very, very end, right? Because you can see why, you know, you're just wasting a lot of operations if you were always treating those as if they could be set to something else and you never set them to something else. But anyway, uh, so that's how that works. And you can see that's how our matrices are constructed. So now we have the ability to construct uh, rotation. You know, by, by looking at this, we can construct rotation, scaling, and translation, which is really all we ever do in Handmade Eero. That's all we do. Now, we could also do shearing. And I, maybe we do do some shearing. We could also do shearing, again, because since we have control over the axes, we can shear the axes as well. So we actually also have shearing here. And by the way, the scaling is non-uniform, right? So we can scale the x, y, and z separately as well. We can create matrices that do all of these things. And now, because of matrix multiplication, we can also combine them all. So we can just make matrices that do whatever we want. And we can combine them all together. And when we want to transform something, we can transform it all the way from wherever it starts to the very end of every transform that needs to happen, all with one matrix. And that's pretty great, right? It saves a ton of work uh, in terms of manipulating the points around. Uh, OK, so that's all real good. Uh, and everyone's happy, and everything's fantastic, right? But uh, <clears throat> we've got one, one more problem. There's something that we have not addressed this entire time. Uh, and we've never had to address it uh, because we always sort of did just the one part of it that was relevant by hand in the Handmade Hero pipeline. But because we're now going to be talking about a real camera transform, we have one more thing that we have to get right. Hopefully all of that was fairly uh, easy for everyone to understand and work out. Um, if it's not, we'll try to tackle it in the Q&A. Um, but the thing that we have never really made explicit because we never had to uh, is the concept of a camera transform. And a camera transform is not the same as an object transform. Uh, it is the same in the sense that mathematically it can still be represented by a matrix because any transform that we probably want to do in three dimensions uh, for rigid transforms like this is usually capable of being represented in a matrix. Obviously, nonlinear transforms are not, but that's a whole separate thing. Uh, but any kind of basic transform like this can be represented, so it can be represented in a matrix. But conceptually, it is very different from an object transform. And so let me take a brief second to explain what I mean by those two things. So an object transform <clears throat> is a transform uh, and again, these are purely conceptual, right? So the math is the same regardless of what you're doing. But we're just talking about conceptualizing these things when you're trying to understand what's happening here. And, and more importantly, I suppose, when you have a goal you want to achieve and you need to do a, it with a transform, how you conceive and construct that transform. An object transform is the kind that we've been talking about so far, which is looking at a matrix like this. It's looking at a matrix where the x-axis is here, the y-axis is here. The z-axis is here. It's got 0, 0, 1 here. And we've got a translation component like that. OK? <clears throat> That's an object transform. 
And what an object transform is, is it's a transform that takes something from the origin and a root coordinate system, right? So it's like I've got x, y, and z, and, I, and I'm thinking about some shape, you know? I don't know what it is. Uh, I've got some, like, maybe a little, I don't know, like a triangle here. It's aligned there, right? Here's my triangle. I'm taking it as it's defined in a base coordinate system where all the axes are cardinal and there's no scaling. You know, I'm conceiving of it just defined as it is. And I'm transforming it such that the axes of this matrix and the origin offset of this matrix become the new way that is being interpreted, right? So now, <clears throat> say this matrix is A, so this is AX, AY, AZ, and AT, right? Now, this may have been, this is like sort of the root, the base XYZ coordinate system. I'm taking it from there, and I'm putting it into some new coordinate system, right? Uh, as defined by the, the uh, contents of that matrix. So this was 0, 0, 0 before. Now the origin, the base of that, uh, is at AT. Uh, and all of my axes are now whatever the axes uh, were specified as over here, right? And so when we conceptualize a matrix by looking at its columns, <clears throat> we are talking about it as if it as if we are conceiving it. We are conceptualizing this matrix as this process. Because remember, a matrix is just a bag of numbers at the end of the day, right? It's just a bag of numbers and a rule about how we multiply them together. So it was purely my conceptualization of the matrix and how I explained it to you that is why we picked it out in terms of columns, right? We didn't, there's nothing in the matrix that says it has to be picked out in terms of columns. It just so happens that if you conceive of the matrix in columns like that, then the meaning of the matrix is clear for those columns, right? That's one way we can analyze what a matrix does is by looking at the columns and saying those columns, if we were to apply this matrix to a geometric shape, the points of a geometric shape in series, those columns would form the new coordinate system for that shape. And that fourth column, uh, in the homogeneous coordinate way would form its origin. That is what will happen to those numbers in the matrix if we conceive of them as columns. And that's a very useful way to look at it because oftentimes that's exactly what we want to build. We want to build an object transform so we know that we can stuff those coordinates in here in that way to produce this result. <clears throat> right? And that's great, I think. However, there's more than one way to conceptualize the parts of a matrix, right? This <clears throat> uh, we might call the column picture. It's the way of looking at a matrix uh, that focuses on the columns and what that means. And the column picture produces an object transform, right? The column way of looking at it looks at it as if it is this process. <clears throat> but we could alternatively look at the row picture, right? The row picture is what happens if we take the other slice. What if we looked at what the rows of a matrix mean, right? Cutting the other way. And if we look at the row picture, then we get a camera transform. And the reason this is important for us to understand is because that's what we actually want to make right now in Handmade Hero. When I turn off this blackboard and go to the code, that's what I got to type in. <clears throat> right? So what does that mean? Well, if we go back here, <clears throat> uh, I've conveniently uh, sort of, ha oops, that's not right. This is a point. Uh, I've conveniently written this entire thing out for one 
uh, of the of the uh, for for one column, right? For a vector, <coughs> and that's really all I need uh, to explain the row picture to you. I'm sorry, I'm I'm really I'm kind of sick today. I I I'm very like throat cloggy, so I constantly have to clear my throat. <coughs> it's tough talking sometimes. Uh, so what I encourage you to do before to get to the column picture was to pull out the columns, right? I was saying, oh, OK, you know, here's the px term. And you can see the x, y, and z terms uh, coming into an x vector here, y vector, z, you know, and z vector here. But what if we were to look at this, <clears throat> right? What if we were to look at it the other way? Well, this also looks like something for those of you who you know <clears throat> uh, remember all of your handmade hero. What does that look like to you, right? If looking at it this way looks like something we can pull columns out of, what does this look like? <clears throat> I'll give you a second. Well, let's take a look. PXXX, PY, YX, PZ, ZX, right? That, to me, and then of course the 1, 1 TX, right? <clears throat> that, to me, looks an awful lot like the dot product that we've talked about, right? Or inner product. Why does it look a lot like an inner product? Because a matrix multiplication is just a series of inner products at the end of the day, right? Each position in the output is just a dot product of the column of the, of the right-hand term times the row of the left-hand term, right? So while I can think of it the way I was thinking of it before as being a series of column additions, that's the column picture, I can also think of it as a series of dot products, and that's the row picture of the incoming matrix. Uh, of the, uh, the left-hand side matrix, right? <clears throat> this term is the dot product of the column of B with the row of A, right? It's basically like a row dot producted with a column, right? And we do that. Every one of the terms in the resulting matrix is what, whatever the corresponding row of A times whatever the corresponding column of B, it's that dot product. That's what it is. So if I instead want to conceptualize this matrix as thinking about what the rows of it mean. So now let's say we've got our x-axis. Instead of sticking our x-axis in the column, what if we stuck our x-axis in the row? right? And we'll leave the translation out of it for the moment. Right? What if we did that? Well, now when we have px, py, and pz coming in, right, uh, which is just our, our vector p, and here's our a, uh, and we'll do ax, ay, az for our um, for our rotation there, uh, for our for our axis component. Now when we do this, right, the result is actually just the ax dot producted with p, right, plus the tx, translation term, a y dot producted with p plus the translation term, a z dot producted with p plus the translation term, right? There's a one there. <clears throat> That's exactly what we get. And really, we can just write this the whole way out if I wanted to include the tx, ty, tz, in the row, it would just be ax transpose p if the tx was in there, right? Because it's still a dot product the whole way. I've just chosen to leave the translation separate, again, because we're trying to think about what this means conceptually. It's easier to keep translation as a separate translation, because that is what it actually does. Because this term is 1, there is no con contribution of p here, right? <clears throat> so this is a different way of conceptualizing what happens in the matrix. So if we were to write both of these out so you could kind of see them, because it, it, it's 
works every time you do matrix multiplication. Both of these things is happening conceptually. It's which one you choose to focus on, right? Uh, is to understand what the matrix is doing. Uh, you can think about it two different ways, right? Here is a way, and I'll write it so uh, let's let's write it this way. And I'll just do the three by three. We'll leave out the translation because you can see that it was it was uh, the same in either case. There, it doesn't really matter, right? Here's the row picture. Here's row of x times p. And maybe I'll just write it this way. Right? Here's the row picture. Here's the column picture. Okay. The row picture produces a vector that is the row dot producted with the uh, oops with the incoming point. The column picture, and I I guess I won't bother drawing because I don't have space. Let's just say we're multiplying by this again. The column picture produces a combination of the columns, right? This and this are the same result, right? Because this is, could be the same exact matrix, right? the same bag of numbers, exactly the same. But in terms of how we want to conceptualize what it does, we can think of matrix multiplication, uh, and this, in this case, uh, matrix times a vector, but again, Matrix times a vector is just the same as matrix multiplication, because again, multiplication by the matrix is just taking the columns uh, of the right-hand side and doing the matrix transform to them conceptually, right? So they're the same thing, just one does more. Uh, <clears throat> we can conceptualize the same bag of numbers two different ways. One way is to say, let's pretend that we had axes on the rows of this matrix, that each bag of numbers that was three across was going to be one of our axes, x, y, and z. Well, if that's the case, then the operation of what this matrix does to those axes is it dot products the incoming point with each of them. And the result is the dot product uh, in the x coordinate, it's the dot product with the x axis. In the y coordinate, it's the dot product with the y axis. In the z coordinate, it's the dot product with the z axis. Right? That's the row picture. And that's a camera transform. I'm going to tell you why in a second. On the other hand, um, if we take a look at this picture, the column is just a combination of the columns you know, scaled by the incoming point. right? That is exactly, you know, sort of, it, again, exactly the same reason. These two are equivalent values. The result is the same. The two vectors are exactly the same. It's just how we're choosing to capsulize them. If instead we conceptualize the axes as whatever was in the columns, right? then that's the column picture. And that's that object transform that we already know and uh, are very familiar with, right? Because this is exactly what we already know and what we've done many, many times on Handmade Hero. So now the question is just, OK, so if I want to make a transform matrix, and I'm trying to make a transform matrix that encapsulates an object transform, I know I just put things in the x, I know I put my x and y and z axes into the columns of a matrix, and then I can just use it as a transfer matrix that, that will do an object transform. It'll move a point from the origin coordinate system out to wherever those axes are, uh, where their origin is, where the axes are, uh, along those axes, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the question is, what is a camera transform, and why does this do it, right? What's this other row picture? Because hopefully you all agree with me that this is definitely a different way we could interpret the math. But how does this different interpretation of the result, right? how does this different grouping, how we've chosen to summarize the terms of what happens when you multiply a matrix times a vector, how does that end up giving us any insight into how we produce a camera transform? And what even is a camera transform? right? And that's the part that I want to get to here. So let's talk about that. Uh, and hopefully that'll become clear. What we wanted to do with an object transform is we wanted to take something right from you know it's uh, I, I, I there's really isn't a good word for this necessarily uh, but we could say it's native space right or sometimes it's called object space right 
we're talking about that space again that's just the like untransformed unperturbed uh space um where we've just got the you know zero 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 here and we've got the the x y and z axes here right we're what we're trying to do with an object transform is we're trying to take some things defined here, I don't know, some point, uh, some shape, a polygon, who knows what it is, and we're trying to transform them out to any other thing. Like maybe these axes are all bent around and they're super weird and they're scaled all weird, right? Uh, and the origin moved somewhere, uh, but we still want this shape to be existing there. And so it's just a transform that does that placement. Right? You might even think of it as a placement transform. It places something in the world with a certain set of axes. Right? Well, a camera transform is something that does the opposite of that. A camera transform is something that we conceptualize and often want to do where we have some stuff out in the world. Right? And we've got some, you know, we've drawn many times. We've got some observer here, and they want to view this thing, right? They want to see this thing. Well, in order to do any of that stuff that we were doing, those projections, right? Remember all those projections where we set up the similar triangles, right? And we were projecting all the things down on there. We talked about that just last two weeks ago, I don't know, whatever. All that stuff. All of that assumed that we were already in the space of the camera, right? We assumed that all everything had been rotated and moved so that it was sitting in front of the camera. And the camera's coordinate system was native. All of that stuff was just assumed. Because, you know, we did things like saying, oh, yeah, OK, uh, the x coordinate of this thing uh, on the screen, right, is going to be equal to the x coordinate of this thing in world space, you know, over like the z coordinate of the thing in world space or whatever, right? It assumes that the x of the screen, the, out, the result in x, is based solely on the input in x. And the only way that that is true is if we already moved, you know, this is on an angle here. Right? The x-coordinate on the screen is some complex equation of x and y going this way right, to produce that x-coordinate. So we've just been assuming this whole time that before you did any of that projection stuff that we talked about, that you had already transformed the world so that it was nice sitting right in front of the camera, right, where x-coordinates were on the x-axis and y-coordinates were on the y-axis. We weren't assuming that the x-axis and y-axis themselves, right? Here's the x-axis. The y-axis comes out of the screen. This is the z-axis, right? We weren't assuming that those axes were all bent in world space somewhere, like rotated around. We assumed that all that was taken care of. And that was never a problem on Handmade Hero because we never rotated the camera on Handmade Hero. The whole world was just always constructed perfectly in line with the camera's x and y axes, right? We never conceived of it being tilted, the world like being tilted relative to the camera. We never conceived of it being spun like this, right? So we never had to do a camera transform other than just the simple offsetting of z, right? All we ever did was assume that the camera was looking down on the world, right? Here's the world, uh, and here's the camera. And so all we ever did was like plus or minus z to move the camera like higher or lower. That's all we did. We never tried to make the camera like come over here and view the world from the side. And that's exactly what we need to do now. So a camera transform is one that undoes transforms in some sense, you could say, right? The world is out there, everything's in world space, but our camera is implying some other space. And we want to take a tilted space, a rotated space, an offset space, the space of the camera, and we want to make it the origin. We want to make 0, 0 appear here. We want to make its axes be the cardinal axes so that it is straight 
The camera is perfectly straight in world space. Its x-axis lines up with the world x-axis. Its y-axis is the world's y-axis, right? So we're moving the whole world so that the world x, y, and z axes now correspond to the camera's axis, moving everything else so that the camera can be at the center of the world pointing in exactly the z direction, right? Or the opposite of the z direction in this case. That's what we need to do. And we've never done anything like that before, right? We did this with position, and it was very simple. We never did it with rotation. How do we do it with position? Well, the way that we did it with position was saying, well, all right, you know, here's the origin of the world. Here's a point that I'm trying to view. Here's the camera, right? If I want the camera to be as if it was at 0, 0, 0, right, all I have to do is subtract whatever the camera's position is, right? If I subtract C from C, right, it becomes 0. And this becomes C, right? This C minus C is 0. So I just subtract C from everything, right? So I have P minus C, which is here. And hey, look at that. We get the world, right, moved back to the origin for the camera. So for translation, it's very simple. We just negate it, right? That's all we had to do was take wherever the camera was, negate that, and that is the transform we applied to all the points in the world to move them back so that the camera's at the origin. That, I think, we did do on Handmade Hero, right? So in some sense, we had a little bit of a camera transform. It just wasn't really much of a transform. It was just an offset so we could, we could avoid having to think about the more complicated aspects of how we view things, right? So we, now we need the second picture. We need, uh, or, or rather, I should say, we need the, the other operation. We need to figure out how if we had a set of rotated axes, how would we go about moving the world so that it lined up with them, right? So let's say, you know, obviously we know how to do translation. Let's leave that aside for a second. Let's say here we are, okay, and the camera is looking this direction, okay? So here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis, uh, but the camera is looking this direction. And maybe I shouldn't say looking this direction, because in 2D, it's hard to say looking. Looking is going down the z-axis in our 3D. Uh, so let's be a little bit more specific here. Let's say that this is the camera's x-axis, and this is the camera's y-axis. OK? And so what that means is if we had a point, let's say that there was a point that was right here, OK? Well, if we wanted to produce the version of the world where the camera's axes were aligned with the, with the world axes, this whole thing has to rotate back down this way, right? We want to make it so that CX is here and CY is here, which would put this point somewhere over here, right? Probably like right there or something, right? It would rotate down this way. How do we do that, right? How do we do that? Uh, and so to make this a little bit clearer, I'm going to draw it on two diagrams, right? There's one. Here's two. So what I effectively want to do is I want to turn this into this. Uh, here's my p, and here's my p prime. Oops. Right? So remember, everything that we've been thinking about so far, we've been doing this. We've been taking something from an origin-centered coordinate system and moving it out somewhere else, right? Like when we were rotating our sprites. We were thinking about the sprites being defined in this space, and we're doing them out this way so that now we could rotate our sprites, right? That's the object transform. And now we need to figure out how to do the opposite thing. We need to do that camera transform, which is we've got the world all rotated out and weird, and we need to move it back so that it aligns with our camera. Right? So <clears throat> how do we do it? Well, if you take a look at what we need to produce here, it gives us a pretty big clue. 
what are the coordinates of p prime in this case, right? Well, the coordinates of p prime, if cy and cx are the new axes, right? It's just the perpendicular sort of, if I measure what p prime is, it's the perpendicular measure of p prime against those axes, right? That's how we've been doing coordinate systems since day one on Handmade Hero. You go out along one axis to the x coordinate, you go out along the y axis to the y coordinate, and you arrive at the point. And the opposite is also true. If I want to reverse engineer what the coordinates are, I just have to look at where my point is projected onto those axes, and that is the coordinates of the point, right? We've done this on Handmade Hero already way, way back when. It is the inner product, or dot product, right? That is how we measure things. Do you remember it? When we have a vector, right? Here's my vector A, and some other vector B, if I want to take the dot product, or if I take the dot product of these two, it is equal to the length of A times the length of B times the cosine of angle between them. Right? Now we did this many, many times on Handmade Hero. Hopefully you can dig back and remember it. Uh, but this is the inner product right here. What does that do for us? Well. If we suppose that A is unit length, which we can make it because this is an axis. If we want to measure things along an axis, this could be an axis. Axes, we can just set them up to be unit length, right? We know we can make things unit length. If A is unit length, then A transpose B, this term goes away because it's a 1, right? And multiplying by a 1 does nothing. We just get the length of B times the cosine of theta. What is that? Well, if you imagine this right triangle, Right? What we would get in this case is this distance. Right? Why? Because the cosine of theta for a right triangle, right? Uh, the cosine of theta is the ratio of the hypotenuse of the triangle to this side. Right? You could say the interior side, the side along the angle, right? The sine is, is out here, right? And so whatever the length of the hypotenuse is, in this case, that's the length of B, right? Because that B is the, the long side of the triangle. We know that the length of this side is just the length of the hypotenuse times the cosine, and the length of this side is just the length of the hypotenuse times the sine, right? So if we want to measure a vector, a point, along an axis somewhere, if that axis is unit length, the dot product gives us precisely that. It gives us precisely the distance along. So what can you see in this diagram now? Well, I know what these two axes are, and I know I could make them unit length. Even if they weren't unit length, I mean, our camera probably is going to have unit length axes to begin with anyway. We're probably not going to be scaling the world up and down by some weird camera transform, right? So they're probably going to be unit length to begin with, but even if they weren't, I can make them unit length. And if they're unit length, then all I have to do is take the dot product of the point in world space with those world space camera axes, and I get exactly what I needed. I get exactly the coordinates of this point in the camera space as if the camera was itself the world space. And that's exactly what I needed. That undoes the rotation and produces this, from this, that is exactly our camera transform. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some way with a matrix to take all of our camera axes and dot product incoming points with them? Wouldn't that be swell? Yes, it would be swell. And it is literally that, right? It is exactly what happens when you put your axis coordinates into a matrix as the rows, not the columns. So instead of taking your x, y, and z of the x-axis and putting them along the column, you take your x, y, and z of the x-axis and put them along the row, y-axis, x, y, z, y, uh, z-axis, x, y, z. 
it does exactly that. It produces the three dot products of the incoming point with the three axes that you have specified. And that is exactly what we wanted to do. That is exactly the equation that I used to produce this result. OK? So that's where we get to sort of the final understanding of a transform matrix, right? Um, which is that the rows are camera axes, uh, and the columns are object axes. And you can look at them either way. You can use them either way, right? Now, those of you who like to inquire into things a little more deeply are probably naturally asking the question at this point, how is that possible? What does that even mean? Why is it that I can look at a matrix, this bag of numbers, right? And I can choose to put things in the columns, and it does one kind of transform. And I can choose to put things in the rows, and it does a different transform. And yeah, I saw you do the math, but isn't that weird? It's just weird, right? It's spooky that that works. How's that working? Right? Uh, well, here's where that transpose uh, adds a little bit of insight uh, to the scenario. Right? One thing we know about uh, matrix transposing is that it does exactly the flip between these two things, right? If I have a matrix where I've put x, y, <clears throat> and z down the columns, right? If I was to transpose that matrix, I would get this. Right? I mean, all I'm doing is exactly, you know, the diagonal stays unchanged, but in each case, the, the two pieces of what was there swap, right? So in, you know, and I'll, I'll do it out just in case it's not clear enough, I guess. XX, XY, XZ, YX, YY, YZ, ZX, ZY, ZZ. If I transpose this matrix, I just get it, you know, these swap, these swap, these swap, right? I'm just flipping the indices of the, of the things transpose like we've done many times before. X, 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 Y, X, Z, Y, X, Y, 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 Z, Z, X, Z, Y, Z, Z. Right? It does exactly this, this, this operation. The transpose flips the rows and columns uh, and produces uh, the, the matrix with them in the other location, right? In the other uh, sort of orient. I don't know what the right way to say it is. It takes the columns, things that were going columnar, and makes them go row. Right? So what do we know about that sort of uh, transpose thing way back when on Handmade Hero? You have to do a deep dig here and go back and watch that episode. Uh, we said <laughs> that for an orthogonal matrix, Uh, the inverse is the transpose. And we spent like a whole episode or two uh, trying to show how that was true. And we went through a bunch of different uh, things uh, where we tried to kind of like demonstrate ways in, that, in which that worked, right? Well, here we get finally to how this stuff is actually working internally, right? When we look at what actually happens here, the camera transform and the object transform are the opposite type of transform, right? We end up in a situation where we take a camera uh, and we move it from, you know, a camera transform is a thing that moves something from world space back into like sort of an origin uh, system for the axes. And the opposite is true of an object transform. It takes things from a place where they're defined around the origin and the axis system uh, basic axis system and moves them to a different axis system and different origin, right? And the only difference between those two is whether we put things in the column or whether we put things in the row. The reason for that is specifically that we are inverting the transform. That's what we're actually doing here, right? And we're inverting the transform 
by transposing it because, hey, these happen to be unit axes that I was talking about there, right? That dot product thing only works if these things are unit axes. If they're not, there's an inverse thing that has to happen with scaling, and it's not worth us going into that right now, but it, the structure continues the further you dive into it. Uh, it's not arbitrary. So when you actually happen to have a bunch of unit axes here and you flip them like that, you actually get the opposite transform, which is exactly what we see when we put things into rows or into columns, right? So the math actually works out very deeply in this way. It actually, the structure follows all the way through and it keeps going. Uh, even if you start talking about things where you have shear and, and scale and stuff like that, it just becomes more complicated than simply transposing. There's more to the inverse and there's more to that, but uh, that's basically what it is. So the reason that this happens to work is actually because inverting a transform is by definition solving the equations that lead to this, right? If I have an object transform and I do the inverse of the matrix, which is something we haven't really covered in much depth, if I do the inverse of the matrix, I get the opposite transform. That's what inverse means. It's the thing that would take the result of the previous transform and turn it back into the original input, right? Um, you know. Uh, if I have p prime equals a p, right, the inverse of the matrix is the thing that would have done the opposite operation. If we start with a point and we multiply by a matrix and get a result, if we inverted that matrix, we could multiply by the result and get back the input, right? Well, in this case, all we're doing is taking advantage of, in some sense, the fact that a inverse equals a transpose in the case where we have nice unit axes that meet at right angles, like we do in the case of what we're working with, right? And so because of that, it just so happens that the inverse transform, therefore, is very easy to conceptualize and use. All we have to do is go from putting things in columns to putting them in rows because the transform is the inverse. It is the inverse operation in this limited case. That is not important to understand uh, for the purposes of what we're doing, but for people who want to dig deeper into the math and get more acquainted with linear algebra, just thought I'd point that out as an interesting avenue to, to, to look down and understand. All we really care about in Handmade Hero is the fundamental activity, which I just showed, which is that we want a bunch of dot products, and putting things in the rows is what gets us those dot products. Right? OK. <clears throat> So now let's put it all together. What we want to do is we want some rotations, right? We've got a rotation matrix. We've got a rotation matrix around x, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, around y, whatever. Uh, so we've got some rotations that we might want to do to the camera, right? We want to do something where we're saying, like, OK, let's apply rotation 0. Let's apply rotation 1. Maybe even rotation two. I don't know. I think we're probably only going to have two rotations, right? Uh, and then uh, we want to take those uh, rotations. We probably want um, a translation as well, right? Uh, and we want to start combining these. So let's talk about how we're going to actually do this. All right. So we've got a situation where we've structured our world uh, so that this is the z-axis that comes out of the plane, right? Uh, and then we've got sort of our, our, uh, our x-axis. Uh, and our y-axis look like this, right? Uh, and the camera kind of looks down on the world, right, by default. <clears throat> so that's what we're dealing with. So what we want to do here is we would like to allow ourselves to rotate this camera around, right? We would like to have uh, a way for us to produce a rotated version of this camera uh, with rotated axes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and we'd like to be able to produce multiple of these rotations because what we might want to do is like rotate the camera down to here, but then also rotate it around, right? So we would like to be able to uh, orbit the camera around the world, right? That's what this is typically called. We like to be able to orbit uh, the camera around the world this way um, and and this way, right? And this is I don't really know what you would call that specifically. This, I think this one's also called azimuth, but I don't know what you call this one typically. 
because uh, we're ro you're kind of we're rotating around it, right? And all this time we want to be looking kind of in at the world, right? So we're trying to kind of have the camera be able to spin around uh, the the uh, the world and always be looking kind of back at at like this focus point, right? Whatever the point in the world here is that you know where the center of the room that we're on, let's say, we want to be able to spin it all around uh, and all around vertically as well. Uh, we just want to be able to do that and uh, and get uh, uh, a view that matches that, right? So what we need to do in order to do that is we need to produce two things, right? Because we just showed how we could you know how we can work through the math uh, for doing camera transfer. We need to produce two things. First of all, we need to produce the axes of the camera, right? Because we need to know what those are in order to produce the camera transform. So wherever the camera ends up, we need to know where its axes are. And we know uh, what those look like um, for any given point. Uh, we have an idea of what we're trying to get here. If this is the XYZ of the world, right, and the camera is out here, we know that if the camera's looking this direction, we know z goes the opposite direction of that, right? Because remember, z comes back at the camera in our traditional form. So we know that z comes back at it, y is pointing up, right? And x is pointing out to the side. So we know that for any camera out here that's viewing the world this way, you know, here's our eye point looking out. We know that z comes out at us, and we know that our xy is like that sort of like if the director holds up his hand like that, you know, that's our xy. That we're looking at. Uh, so we know we need to produce something like that. So we need to produce those axes, and then we also need to produce the position, right? So we need to be able to orbit our camera around and be able to produce uh, that that position as well, so that we can uh, transform the world to be around that, right? To be uh, centered around that. So we need to do both of those things. So how do we do that? Well. We can do all of this now with the transform stuff that we wrote. Uh, and I think we, I don't think we wrote a vector transform. So we're going to have to probably just quickly go do that. It's a much simpler case than the matrix transform because it's just doing one column, basically. Uh, but we haven't written it, so we would have to write it. OK. Um, so uh, sorry, this is bugging me. It's getting stuck on the zipper. There we go. Um, so. We can actually do all of this with what we wrote relatively easily because we know where the camera starts, right? We know that the camera starts up here. Um, here, it, oops, I don't know why that was Y. It's supposed to be Z. Um, we know the camera starts up here. The Z axis points towards it, uh, and we know that sort of the the Y axis and the X axis are look like that, right? So what we could do if we wanted to, we know this point. We know that it's just x and y 0, right? We know it's 0, 0. And then it's however far the camera is off of 0. It's however high up the camera is, right? So it's just the height of the camera. So we know how to start out where we are. So then to rotate it around, uh, all we would have to really do is build a rotation matrix, right? and apply that rotation matrix to the point. Once we have a rotation matrix, we can rotate it. And so if we wanted to do, for example, um, let's say we want to do an X rotation. So that would pitch us up and down, right? Maybe the mouse pitches up and down so we can lean this way, right? That is just going to be a rotation about the X axis. So we can have one theta that's like an X axis rotation. And we can produce that matrix. We can take this point, this is the camera point to start with, right? That's our point. And we can apply that X rotation matrix to the point. That would rotate the, the, the point around, and we would get the new location of the camera, right? Furthermore, uh, we know what the camera's axes are. Uh, we know the camera's axes are just the basic axes. They're just Z y, and x, right? The camera's axes are aligned uh, with the, the world axis, right? So if we want to know what those camera axes are when we do the rotation, we can do the same thing to the axes, right? So we could take the camera's axes and multiply each of them. But hey, 
the camera's axes is just the identity matrix, right? It's just 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So really, the axes of the camera are just the matrix, right? It's just, hey, what is that camera matrix? Well, it's the rotation matrix times the starting camera matrix. This is the identity matrix. It doesn't have any rotation in it. It's just straight up and down, right? So this term goes away, and this is just Rx, right? So we know that what we produce for our transfer matrix also is the axes. If we know what the axes are, then we can directly put those axes into our, uh, into our matrix and produce the dot products that we wanted, right? OK. So uh, I feel like I've thrown a lot at you here, uh, and I do apologize for that. But we've got one last thing to cover before we can type in the code. Hopefully all of that made sense, and hopefully it's clear what we would do here, right? But we have one more problem, and that is combining translation uh, and rotation in camera transforms. Right? So this gets a little trickier. Why does it get a little trickier? Well, look what happens when we multiply uh, our matrix by a point with translation. We get what I've said many times before. We get a result that is px times x plus py times y plus pz times z plus t. OK? That's what we get. If we want to make this a camera transform, like we said before, it's fairly straightforward what happens with our axes. We just flip them around. And we get the measure that we wanted. We get x transpose p, y transpose p, z transpose p, plus t. Right? And that's exactly the measure we wanted. Problem is, do you see the problem? You see the problem. Maybe you don't see the problem. You probably don't see the problem because you've never looked at this stuff before. And it's pretty hard to see problems where you've never looked at stuff before. This is the problem. The problem is in both cases, the translation component is just added at the end. Why? Because it's the same transform, right? Again, when we look at these things differently, we're like, well, we can stuff some stuff in here and get a different conceptual result. It's still a matrix multiplied at the end of the day. It still only does one thing. And we can conceptualize that thing in different ways to learn how to construct matrices that do things we want. But at the end of the day, the math isn't changing underneath. And what we know is that the translation always gets added at the end. So the question is, for a camera transform, what does the translation have to be? We would like it to be the negative of the camera position, wouldn't we? Because just like in the object transform, we put the object's position in here, and it places things out in the world, we would love to have this be the camera's position, right? And we could just set it to be negative. And then it would be, oh, subtract the camera position. Great, right? Not great. Why is it not great? Because the thing we wanted was the opposite of this transform. And by doing the opposite of this transform, what we would have needed to have done, right, is we would have needed to have subtracted before we took the measure. So what we really wanted was x transpose p minus camera, y transpose p minus camera position, right? Z transfers P minus camera position. That's what we wanted. We wanted, if we had this, right? I'll draw that picture again. Here's the camera. Here's the point. 
the axes of the world look like this, and maybe they're out here, right? What we wanted to do was we wanted to measure this point from the origin which we said was at the camera, right? Along the axes, along these axes. That's what we were trying to do. But what this is going to do, right, what this transform is going to do, is it's going to measure them along the axes before this becomes the origin. So this is going to be the origin at prior to, you know, before we do that subtraction. This is going to be the origin, right? So what we're really going to do is we're going to measure it along this axis. So rather than getting the distance here, we're actually going to get the distance here. Right? It's not what we wanted. Right? It's a problem. Uh, because while it's correct in terms of the rotation it's going to do, which is fine, right? Uh, the rotation will come out uncorrected, but the position will all be wrong because it's measuring around the wrong origin. So the question is, how do we turn this into this, right? How do we make that happen? Well, lucky for us, the dot product is distributive. It's a distributive operator, right? It's just scalar. So we can actually turn this into an equation that's easier to work with. This can actually be turned into x transpose p minus x transpose c, y transpose p minus y transpose, oops, transpose c, z transpose p minus z transpose p, c, right? This is this, right? These are the same equation. I just distributed this out. So if we have to shoehorn our transform into this, actually not so bad. This is this vector. So this vector simply has to equal this, which means that all we have to do to construct this matrix is stuff into the t component the camera's position pre-negated and dot producted with our axes, right? And hey, what is this? Well, it's just the matrix times c, right? It's just the matrix times c. So all we really need to do is first transform the camera position by the matrix and negate it, stuff that into the transform, and then when we multiply the point by this composite transform, it will produce the residual terms we needed to make ourselves compute this instead of this. Does that make sense? Hopefully it makes some sense. So we need to do that or our positions will come out wrong. So let's take a look at how we build that. Right? Let's take a look at how we build the camera transform. So let's say I've got an inline here. I'm going to do, uh, I don't know why it's inline, actually. And I want to build a camera transform. The way I want to build that camera transform is I want to assume that I'm going to have um, a set of axes that I'm going to use, and I am going to have a position that I want to use. right? And I want to produce the 4x4 four four that, that does that. Uh, so I'm going to have the x-axis, I'm going to have the y-axis, I'm going to have the z-axis, and I'm going to have the position. How would I construct this? Well, first I can construct uh, my, uh, my axes. And in fact, you know, I might make this because we're probably going to want this as well, uh, which is uh, we could do columns 3 by 3 and uh, rows 3 by 3, where I just pass in. Uh, in both cases, what I want the axis to be. Uh, and then we can produce the column version or the row version of that matrix. Uh, so again, in this case, we just produce the result here. Uh, in this case, it's just uh, the column picture. Uh, so again, I'm just, uh, well, here, I'll do it out this way so it's a little clearer for you. Ah, man, I. I need some way of hinting to Forcoder that doesn't need to do that. Um, there we go. One extra. There we go. 
So again, I'm just putting these in in column order, as you can see, exactly like we wrote the math on the blackboard. Uh, and hopefully you can see that looks really clean. It's just the x down, x axis goes down the column, first column, y goes down the second, z goes down the third, right? Uh, and then we just kind of return that as our column matrix. Same thing with rows three by three. All we're going to do here is reverse that, right? So in this case, I'm going to do x y, x z on the columns, y x, y y, y z zx, zy, zz. And there's the row picture. Right? OK. So what I know for producing this camera transform is all I really need to do uh, is I need to stuff these into the columns. right? So I know that I start with the rows 3 by 3 picture where I just put those in. Now I've got a matrix that does nothing other than just undo the rotation implied by those x, y, and z axes. So it's, it's the rotation part of the camera transform, uh, but it doesn't do the position yet. right? So like I said, what we need to do is we need to produce uh, for our vector, where'd my, where, is, where was it? Here we go. I need to produce the negated pre-transform of this uh, so that I can stuff that into the translation component. right? And in order to do that, uh, I need to multiply the uh, position by the matrix itself. So I need to do like R times P, right, to produce a new vector. Uh, and again, I want to negate that as well. Uh, so this is uh, the like camera P that we're going to use. Put that in there. Uh, and furthermore, I probably want the ability to do something like this, right, um, where I can just set the translation components component of a matrix uh, and go from there. Now, the other thing that I could probably do here, I guess I don't know how I'd want to do it. It depends how I want to do this. Uh, I haven't really thought about it yet. Uh, but uh, maybe maybe set translation is a bad word uh, in this case. Maybe, maybe I'll just say translate like that or something. I'm not sure. I, I, I haven't decided exactly how I want to do that. I haven't thought about it much. Um, but you know, if I have something like this where I say I've got a, a matrix A and I want to do a translation of it, uh, the result, again, is just A. And then for uh, the components of the result, I just want to be able to say um, uh, like that the, the terms get, get added here. right? So I'm just modifying that final part, this part right here. I want to put the translation in there. OK. Uh, so for my camera transform, all I really want to do is I just want to be able to set the translation in the column, which is currently nothing. I want to set that to be equal to the negative uh, of the transform of the incoming point that I'm given um, by, uh, by the matrix itself right? to produce that residual term that I need to correct for. So the only thing I don't have to make that work is I just need some way of multiplying a vector times a matrix, which right now I don't have. Um, but like I said, these are actually exactly the same operation. If I have only a V3 here, right, where I don't actually have uh, a matrix, I've just got a point, um, then I can produce that result uh, pretty easily as well. All I have to do here in this case um, is produce those dot products. And I can assume, like I was assuming before, that the, the, the uh, component uh, in the w component of my vector is 1. And I can just bake that in here when it's a v3, because I know it would be uh, 1. But the other thing I can do, and I often like to write it this way, uh, is allow the person who's passing it in to specify the w in case for some reason they wanted a different w. Uh, so in most cases, it's 1.0. But in other cases, we could make the w coordinate be something different. Right? And so again, for this uh, matrix multiplication, uh, we would do exactly the same thing we were doing before. Uh, only in this case, we don't have to have one of the for i loops. We just do um, the contraction as it regularly is written. Uh, and in this case, we probably want to write it out longhand because we're going to be using the, the, the w uh, specifically here. right? 
Uh, so in this case, I've got this r. I know that I can produce the rx by taking the, the, the px uh, times there we go, uh, the px times the, uh, the first element of the matrix, right? And then again, we're going across the columns of the matrix in this point. At this, uh, in this case, we're going down the rows of the point and across the columns. Oops, I missed one here, like so. Uh, and then again, and then finally, we've got that w coordinate. And you know, this is so we'll call that pw, right? Uh, and this is just something uh, that you know we would have a w result, but in this case, we're not going to return that w result because we're just doing it for a vector. Uh, so we end up with just these equations. Uh, and again, they are exactly the same the whole way down, just we use a different row of A each time. Again, this is exactly like we did it on the blackboard. It's just the, you know, that standard contraction of the point x, y, z, point x, y, z, and in this case we continue to the w, which we're specifying manually, x, y, z, w, x, y, z, w, um, and off we go. Now, the problem here is that if I use this as an operator star, I can't specify any additional parameters here because operator star is just written in C like this. And there's no way to provide an, actual, uh, an additional option to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that be sort of a special case um, operation there, uh, which is just to say uh, that the result equals uh, you know, the transform uh, where we do A times P with 1.0. Uh, and then I'm going to make this be a function you can just call. So if you do want to specify the W coordinate, you can. If you don't want to specify the W coordinate, you don't have to. It'll either be defaulted to 1.0 in that case, or it'll always default to 1.0 if you call it with uh, operator star. So, <clears throat> uh, in this case, we've got a slight problem here, which is that even though this is the way we would notate it in math, we don't have a negation operator for a matrix. It would work if we wanted to, I suppose. Uh, but I, you know, we really just want to tell it, hey, multiply this first if you could. Uh, don't apply the negation operator first, uh, and uh, that you know, solves that problem. All right. <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure why that I'm not super clear on why it couldn't figure out how to do that, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, that seems busted to me. Like it should have been able to figure out that that got applied afterward. But somehow it didn't, and I'm not sure why. That seems really suspicious. Do I have something defined wrong? I don't know. So I'm wondering about that. I guess I don't remember how unary minus binds to things. Maybe unary minus binds before multiplication, and I guess it must. Because that's what we're seeing here, right? The parser is choosing to bind the negative to the r rather than the r times p. Uh, but, you know, what are you going to do? Anyway, so that's the thing that creates the camera transform. And at that point, we actually have a transform we can send down to OpenGL because that is actually the camera transform we could use to transform the world uh, by wherever we wanted to transform the world. Right? We can do anything we want there. Um, and similarly, if we want to, uh, we can also take a look at this um, uh, at these matrices in some other ways. If we want to, we can extract vectors from these matrices. Right? If we want to, uh, you can imagine us doing something like this. where we could pass a matrix in, and we could 
get a result out of it where we just said like, oh, okay, I want to get out a column um, of A. Right? Uh, and we could make that be an index as well. So we could say, oh, uh, yeah, which one? Let's see. Uh, and the same would be true of rows. So if we want to extract either of these things from a matrix, we can do that as well. And this is fairly typical when you make little math libraries like this. Uh, we're writing this mostly not for performance, right? We're writing this math, this is more for utility. It's just to be flexible and easy to use largely because we don't expect to use it so heavily that we would end up in a situation where we cared about lots of little issues like that. Um, but yeah, you can start to see it sort of come together, and this is how this sort of thing typically works, right? Uh, so now we have the ability to specify this stuff. Oops. There we go. <clears throat> Uh, and once we have the ability to specify this stuff, we can actually use it now uh, in our OpenGL system. Uh, and there's a little bit that we have to do here. You can kind of see, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Uh, you can see right now the way that we're setting up our uh, projection matrices is we're actually just sort of specifying a focal length. And we're having the GL system create the matrix on the fly when it goes to process things that are used by uh, things that, that sort of fall under uh, that transform. But what we would like to do now, um, for rather obvious reasons, I think, uh, is we'd like to go ahead and expand this transform to say, hey, why don't we just have the clip rect specify the 4 by 4 itself, right? Like, why don't we just have the 4x4 four four passed down by the clip rect so that we can start to pack our whole camera transform right in there? You know what I mean? So that we don't have to do uh, any, any of this stuff, right? Uh, th that we can pack all this stuff in and not have to do the transforms ourselves, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and make that change. And then I think we may be out of time. And so we've built all the stuff we need. And tomorrow, we can just play around with getting uh, the camera orbiting. Uh, and working, and that'll be a good uh, that'll be a good accomplishment for the weekend, I think, um, <clears throat> given how much mass stuff we had to cover. All right, so let's go uh, take a look at how that works inside render group. Right, we uh, have this sort of concept where we're pushing on uh, the clip recs, and we pass the focal length. So when we do our push clip rect here, um, you can see that happening. Uh, here, there it is. You can see it takes the focal length as the final parameter. Uh, and in this case, what we'd like to do, let's just take a, the, the baby step of rather than recording the focal length, right? Uh, what we could do instead is we can try to put this whole thing uh, in here, right? So the only part that we'll save on the outside is the transpose, because the fact that we have to transpose it is strictly because of the OpenGL fixed function pipeline, which we'll probably get rid of eventually anyway. And even if we didn't get rid of it, there is an extended function we can call called GL load transpose matrix, uh, which would take it in the correct order, the math order that we have it stored in uh, right now. So uh, we know what this safe ratio is. Right, because it's the same thing. We've got the width and height here. Uh, we can just do the divide by them and produce the safe ratio. Uh, we know what the focal length is because someone's passing that into us. So rather than store it here, I'm just going to go ahead and say uh, rect uh, dot transform. Uh, maybe maybe we'll still just call it proj equals projection bc, uh, and that's it. So then when we come out here, we would just say okay, the clip. Uh, projection matrix. Our projection matrix is, that we need to feed to OpenGL is just, oops, um, is just the transpose of that. That's what I was trying to do. There we go. 
uh, and this stuff goes away. So then the only thing that we have to do now is just have it replace that focal length that we were specifying before. Although I don't know where that went. Where is our clip rec structure? There it is. Um, so here, when we push on our clip rect, instead of pushing on just the focal length, uh, we now push on um, the transform itself. OK. Uh, so hey, good. We got the same thing we were getting before. That's exactly what we wanted, because now we've got uh, sort of that ability to specify the entire transform. Um, and you know, I guess we could at this point, if we wanted to, uh, since we've got just a few seconds left, we could just uh, throw some saucy sauciness in here if we wanted to, uh, and take a look at where this is actually being called from. Um, let me take a look. Here it is. Uh, so we're passing the camera transform focal length here. Uh, what we could do, again, is just pass some, a more robust uh, transform here. In fact, we could make it so that we pass the whole transform down. Uh, and then we could uh, produce inside this camera transform the, the actual transform that we're trying to use uh, and pass that down. Uh, that might be the right thing to do. I'm not sure how many places call this. In fact, it looks like almost nobody does call it. Uh, Cutscene should have called it. Uh, but I guess it doesn't because it just uses the debug one. Is that true? Is there a reason our cutscene doesn't call push clip rec? How does it set the focal length? So we've just got it so that inside here, you call perspective and it calls set camera transform, which itself pushes the clip rect. There you go. Uh, so we kind of want to, uh, you know, at this point, we probably want to go ahead and disentangle these a little bit. So I am going to stop here for today, because I think we want to go ahead and do that tomorrow. I'm going go to the head, go ahead and go to the Q&A. Um, but we're at least set up for it. We're going to want to do a little more fussing here, I think, with this pretty soon, because uh, we want to disentangle this now that we've got a pretty uh, clear way of setting that camera transform. I think we want to clean up how that's being called in the exterior code. Uh, let's see. Can you interpolate if you wanted a smooth rotation about a point or axis over time? Uh, you can, uh, but again, interpolation is sort of a, a separate topic in terms of how you want to go about doing that. So if you want to interpolate rotations, uh, you have a number of ways of doing it. If your rotations are coming from angles, for example, um, then you can obviously smoothly interpolate uh, those angles, right? And if you want to interpolate those angles, then you can just produce whatever you want to produce from them. They can just be smoothly interpolated, right? Uh, if you don't want to do that, and you just have two, uh, you know, you just have two matrices that you need to construct, uh, and you need to interpolate between those. Then you're kind of in the whole world of, of angular interpolation, which is where quaternions come in, where all those sorts of things come in. Those become more difficult topics to talk about because that's when you start to have to deal with all of the problems that are, are inherent with rotation. And fortunately, on Handmade Here, I don't think we really have to deal with most of that stuff. 
Um, but it's kind of a topic unto itself, right? If that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Gary Johansson. There have been some problems with trolls causing flame wars in the chat. Uh, I forget who dedicated the manager of the chat to. Oh, yes, if you want a moderated chat, you can actually go to the moderated chat. Uh, it is on the Handmade Network server. Um, you can go there. It's handmade.network's IRC server. And uh, I'll show you how to do that now. Uh, so this is Handmade Network's IRC server. Um, and you saw how I got to there. Right? You can just put Handmade Network IRC in there. Uh, and so if you want a moderated chat, you can go here. And, uh, and they maintain a moderated chat for you to use. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, there's 44 people on the moderated chat right now, in fact. You mentioned about six months ago, I think, that you have new artwork. What's the plan with adding that? Um, I Probably right after we're done with the 3D stuff. Uh, I just wanted to kind of show how to make that modification to the pipeline, uh, if that makes sense. Did you know beforehand that you're going to discard the sorting code? Did you do all that for the sake of teaching a variety of techniques? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, no, I didn't know beforehand that I was going to discard the sorting code. Uh, but I sort of, like I said, I try to structure the stream so that we actually go through each uh, constructive process of, like, you know, I didn't think there was any point, let me put it this way, in just me knowing exactly how I want to do everything and just doing it that way. Because that's not really very useful programming-wise. I was trying to show how you, you know, keep pretty flexible code, and you can modify uh, the code and change your decisions and uh, reevaluate decisions and stuff like that was very important. So I didn't know ahead of time going into it which things I would decide that I wanted to do differently from how I actually did it. Uh, but what I wanted to do was show some number of those through the course of the stream. And I was just fairly certain that since normally I program 3D games and I'm programming a 2D game here uh, for Handmade Hero, I assumed that you know, they would naturally come up, right? Um, so you know, that's, that's just. Uh, that's just what I wanted the stream to be about. You know, I wanted to show how actual programming goes, not here is just how to type in a bunch of code I already know how to write or whatever. Uh, I wanted to show like, oh, well, let me try this as a solution. OK, I didn't like that for these reasons. Let's revisit it, and so on. See if there's any other questions that I missed. I don't think so. All right, if there are no other questions, uh, then I guess we can close the stream for the day.
Do I know anything about DirectX 12? Uh, yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> DirectX 12 is not something that I looked at f for itself very explicitly. Uh, Vulkan, obviously, I know a lot more about because uh, I was on the advisory board for it. Uh, and, you know, they're very similar. Um, but I've never really bothered with uh, DirectX 12 because uh, I, I don't really know that I'm ever going to care about the distinction between Vulkan and DirectX 12. We'll see how it shakes out. It could be that DirectX 12 becomes somewhat of a necessity on Windows if, you know, for whatever reason, Microsoft, you know, pessimizes Vulkan in some way or whatever else happens. You know, s small things like that have happened in the past where there's a reason to use, say, DirectX on Windows, even if you use OpenGL uh, everywhere else or, you know, that sort of thing, because it is the one that's maybe more uh, specifically, it's the one that's more specifically supported by Microsoft, guess what I'd say. But assuming that, uh, you know, Vulkan is competitive in terms of compatibility and support on Windows, then I don't really see any reason to use DirectX 12. Uh, it's basically just doing the same things that Vulkan does, but it's doing them in a way that you can't share code with any anywhere else, right? Uh, so. When are you going to do OOP? Uh, I, I don't uh, program in OOP anymore. Uh, obviously, I used to a long time ago. I, I guess probably the um, last time I did OOP programming was maybe 2001, roughly. Maybe 2000 or so. Um, but I don't find OOP to be very good. And so I tend to not use really any object-oriented programming traditional patterns, I guess I would say. Although sometimes you end up with things where, um, you know, the, the object-oriented version of something and the procedural version of something that isn't explicitly trying to be object-oriented, sometimes they have similar aspects to them, obviously, uh, depending on how you choose to isolate things, if that makes sense. <laughs> Have I ever heard of design patterns? Yes, of course, I've heard of design patterns. I even read the first book that was called Design Patterns. It's not a very good book, unfortunately. Try unit testing your code so we can actually see if something is working. Uh, so unit testing is obviously something that's useful in specific circumstances where you actually have a specific defined test that you want to verify and that you don't feel like you can verify some other way. Uh, so sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. In games, it's oftentimes uh, not a very good idea to rely on unit testing. And the reason that it's a good idea not to rely on unit testing is because most of your bugs happen in non-unit scenarios. Um, <clears throat> Most complicated bugs in games are not unit testable. Uh, and so, you know, unit testing is something you can use. Like, for example, if I wanted to make sure that the math code we just typed in is working properly, I can write a unit test for it and verify that it is. Uh, and that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do if you don't think that you uh, are able to debug those problems uh, in progress in any other way. However, if you can debug them in other ways, then you're wasting your time by writing the unit tests. Because the only benefit to unit tests is if they will uh, save time, right? There's no other point to them. Because if you write unit tests and you don't catch bugs in the unit tests any faster than you would have caught them in the wild, uh, then basically you just spent a lot of time writing code that no one used, you know? Um, so like everything else, unit tests have their place. And I use them when they're appropriate. And in this case, they're not useful to what we're doing at the moment. Uh, but if they were, then we would use them. Will the Molly Rocket team be at Emerald City Comic Con this year? Uh, possibly. Storing Tortoise. 
In terms of profiling, how would you tell when you were hitting upper bounds of CPU, PCI bus, and GPU? Obviously, we already have a CPU profiler. Wondering more about PCI bus and GPU. Um, well, so <clears throat> there's a couple things that you have to do um, sort of as baseline. But to get just a rough picture, uh, you actually can see the GPU PCI bus stuff fairly straightforwardly to get a sort of a high level picture of it by using a GPU profiler, uh, of which there are many. So for example, you can use Nsight that NVIDIA ships, um, which is a tool that's pretty decent. And you can see timeline views that show you where the CPU is waiting on the GPU uh, and, and vice versa. And so if you go and take a look at a tool like that, uh, you can get a sort of high level picture of those problems. But obviously, I would uh, say that you know, that's for the, the basic process. If what you're trying to do is get super aggressive and maximize every last little thing, uh, then there's all sorts of additional stuff you probably have to look at. And it's a pretty complicated problem, involves a lot of experimentation and that sort of thing. But if you're just trying to get reasonable, you know, you're trying to make sure that you're doing a reasonable job scheduling things across the PCI bus, that will tell you what you need to know. So. Zen Mystic, will you use Vulkan in your game at all? Will it still be too new on release or do some kind of tutorial on it? Um, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I don't love Vulkan. Like I said, I don't love the design. Um, but you know, it is what it is. So I'm not super excited to show how to use it because it's like, you know, it's a little disappointing. But um, you know, who knows? We will use OpenGL for the time being because our game will run plenty fast on OpenGL since it is a 2D game and we're not trying to micromanage memory usage and stuff like this, uh, which is, you know, micro micromanaging overlap and transfer and locking and memory and all that sort of stuff is obviously the, the place where you start to really want the kind of manual stuff that you need either from Vulkan or DirectX 12 or uh, OpenGL 4.5 AZDO, which you know, we could go that route as well, which is basically extensions to OpenGL, which allow you to uh, do a lot of the same sorts of stuff you do in Vulkan. And uh, so, you know, will we need to do any of that stuff? No. Might we show how to do some of it at some point because it's just useful for educational purposes? Maybe. Um, but doing a whole Vulkan port doesn't seem like maybe a very good use of time because most of that's just minutia that's about how Vulkan works. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the most productive uh, tutorialing time. <laughs> Frank. Do you think writing my own Ring Zero driver would bypass VAC? You're talking about a Ring Zero driver for what? Windows? I mean, yeah. If, if, here's the thing, right? It used to be that Ring Zero was Ring Zero. So if you wrote something at Ring Zero, you could do anything that you wanted. But the reality is that's not true anymore, right? Ring zero is not the lowest level uh, of, of access. Uh, you know, there's ring minus one, there's ring minus two now, right? There's, I don't do operating systems programming, so I don't even keep track of the crazy ringness of it all. But when they decided to go to hypervisors and VMs and all these sorts of things, and that became a very important you know, segment of the market, ring zero kind of went out the window. So I mean. You know, if you're talking about writing a ring zero driver for something, it gives you certain, uh, you know, it gives you certain privileges that you certainly don't have when you're not in ring zero. But at the same time, uh, increasingly, and I don't even keep up with this, uh, in Windows, obviously, there's tons of things uh, that are unbypassable even at ring zero, right? Because just from a security standpoint, 
uh, you know, ring zero isn't, doesn't get full access to the machine anymore. Uh, and there's, there's, you know, layers below that that, you know, are not going to be, um, are not going to, going to be bypassable to you just because you're at ring zero. Without an exploit. Soaring Tortoise, is there any way to do that from our own code, or do we have to rely on external tools? Um, so you're talking about the GPU profiler. Uh, there are some ways you can do that, but uh, it, it, it largely depends on the circumstance. So if you're talking about with OpenGL, uh, oops, that's not as how you spell that. Uh, you can actually get uh, a couple of different things. Um, timer query, I think is what it's called. Uh, here we go. So you can do some stuff here uh, where you can insert things into the stream and you can look at the timestamps and, and, uh, and get other pieces of information back. Uh, and then there might be some counters you can get from NVIDIA. Uh, um, I can't remember all of these. There are ones you can get. Uh, let me put it to you that way. Uh, let's see what we got here. So you can see these ones for the AMD uh, that are being exposed here for the performance. Your mileage may vary, right? Obviously, if you, so what happens when you install something like Nsight is it actually, it turns on like debug features of the driver uh, that you want to use. And you know, to what extent you can turn those on yourself, I'm not sure. I usually just use a tool for those purposes when I need to do it. So I've never looked to see whether you can actually get all the same stuff you get from Nsight. Um, so I don't know, right? Uh, probably you can get a lot of that stuff yourself. The reason I say that is because um, there's a fair bit of, of, uh, of third party toolage which, which does do stuff like performance analysis. So I'm assuming that stuff is exposed in ways that it may be manufacturer specific, but are still exposed. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. Graham says, near the beginning of the stream, the back of my chair fell off. I spent the entire stream fixing my chair. It feels more solid now and squeaks less, but I'm afraid to lean back on it. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I mean, it depends how confident you are in your patch job, man. Like, maybe you did a really good job and you can lean back on it, uh, or maybe not. <clears throat> Soaring Tourist, not sure if anyone has mentioned this, but Mac OS X doesn't support OpenGL core profile with OpenGL 1.x functions. This means that if using GL begin, et cetera, the maximum version of GL allowed is 2.1. Uh, yeah, and you know, um, since we decided to do actual 3D, um, you know, it, and use the Z buffer and stuff instead of doing mostly just software rendering and then the OpenGL equivalent of software rendering, right? Uh, we'll probably actually moved to, uh, off the fixed function pipeline. Because the fixed function pipeline is ancient. It's not used anymore by anybody, except in circumstances like what I'm doing here to just show how to do stuff without having to dive into really like more specific things than are necessary at a given time. Um, so you know, we'll probably end up with an OpenGL 3.x you know, uh, situation in the, in the OpenGL backend by the time we're done with this, uh, which is not much, right? Uh, 
looks like we've got no more questions, so I think we are done now. So that's good. <laughs> Handmade hero. Can you name one of those exploits for my driver? Uh, well, so probably not that exist at the moment, right? Uh, there used to be some fun exploits to get past uh, uh, to get past the the ring minus one protections, um, but you know they get fixed very rapidly. Uh, security researchers are constantly finding them, and then people, you know, patch them. So uh, the best one. Uh, that I saw was the there was that one that uh, that they used the aperture map uh, to there was the old memory the the memory aperture mapping thing that they used to to uh, bypass the protections uh, I don't remember uh, if I, I don't know if I can find it. Let's see. I think this might be it. Uh, is there a link to the, I just want the video. Yes, this is it. This is the one uh, that I remember being super awesome. Um, <clears throat> if you're interested in these sorts of exploits, uh, obviously, if you want to actually do an exploit, uh, that bypasses everything, you've got to have like a zero day exploit, right? If security researchers know about it already, then they've patched um, the operating system and everything else. So those exploits are not relevant anymore. But if you're just interested in them from, which I think they're very interesting. I never do this kind of work. So it's very interesting to me to, to see what kinds of stuff people have to come up with to, to find these crazy exploits. Uh, this APIC overlay, um, it maps this aperture, uh, this memory access aperture, in in a way that chips have always done on the x86, uh, and they figured out a way to use it uh, to get to ring minus two, and it's really great. Uh, I would highly recommend watching the video because uh, he does a great job explaining it to. Here it is. Um, I would highly recommend watching this video. Uh, it's really, really cool. And it shows an example of how these kind of exploits take shape. Uh, this is an amazing one. There's probably lots of them if you follow Black Hat stuff. There's probably lots of them. I don't, so I only know of the ones that were particularly amusing that people kind of passed around. So. Can you give Sean M and Sean B's streams a plug before you go, please? Uh, certainly I can. Um, for those of you who are looking for more programming action, um, I'll go ahead and bring those up for you. Um, here we go. Ah, my goodness. This is all getting crazy. OK, let's get that one. Spell that right. There we go. Uh, that's the. That's not what I want. I want the Twitch. I want the Twitch people. I think it's nothing's two, right? Yeah. I just happen to remember it. <clears throat> All right. 
so uh, what the person on the chat was asking is that I mentioned these two other streams. Uh, there's two other programmers who uh, uh, stream pretty often. Also, Jonathan Blow's stream, obviously, Naysayer88 uh, is another great one. In fact, we'll go ahead and bring that one up here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so in terms of, of uh, programming streams, this is Jonathan Blow's stream, obviously, made Braid and The Witness. Uh, he oftentimes shows uh, work that he's doing on his own language and compiler. Uh, that's Naysayer88. It's a great stream to follow. Um, Nothing's Two, that's Sean Barrett, the guy who wrote the render for Thief the Dark Project. Uh, he wrote Iggy at Rad Game Tools and a bunch of stuff. Uh, he is programming uh, like a voxel engine, like, you know, like Minecraft or that, whatever. He's showing how to write one of those. Uh, and that's, he streams that, Nothing's Two on Twitch. Uh, and then Sean McGrath's writing a MOBA. He's the guy who wrote uh, N++'s engine and also the uh, uh, whole thing for Dyad, among a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and he often streams development of his MOBA uh, on the SSS McGrath uh, Twitch channel. So that was all that the, the person on the stream was talking about. Uh, and hopefully that's, that's good. All right. All right. I think we're down to the last question. Down to the last questions. Would a Ring Zero driver bypass the anti-cheat protection of Destiny? I have never looked at the anti-cheat protection for Destiny. I don't even think you would need a Ring Zero driver for the anti-cheat protection of Destiny unless they have a Ring Zero driver, which maybe they do. I don't know. I've never looked at. I've never even played Destiny, so I don't even have an install. I don't even have an installed version of Destiny. Um, but I'll be honest with you. I thought Destiny was only on consoles. Can you get a PC version of Destiny? Yeah, like. I mean. What are you even talking about? Because I'm not sure I get how this would help you. Until Destiny 2, there is no PC version, right? Um, I don't know. I don't play Destiny, so I couldn't tell you. But I didn't think there was a PC version of Destiny. So I'm not sure how you would be bypassing anti-cheat on something that doesn't exist. Oh, OK. Uh, insofar as says that Sh Sean and Sean, the two Sean's I just mentioned, are doing a specific stream today. And he posted the Twitter link to it. Um, I did not know about that stream. So I guess it says that uh, it'll be live on Twitch in about a half an hour. And that was posted at 1230. So I guess at 1 PM that would start. It doesn't say which Twitch channel it'll be on. Uh, so I guess I don't know, but presumably one of those two. How do I read the RAM memory on an Xbox or a PS4? <laughs> you have the weirdest questions. These have almost nothing to do with game programming at all. Probably be better served asking on a game cheat tutorial stream. Um, but the answer of how you read RAM memory on an Xbox or a PS4, I, I'm assuming you mean if you're not running on that system. Uh, and the answer there is you need, you know, like a logic analyzer or something. I mean, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that there's people who create uh, hardware that you basically can attach to other hardware. Uh, that is designed to scan it and see what it's doing. Um, and you don't want to go down that road, right? Like, uh, that, that's just rough. Um, but, you know, you can see there's, there's, if you want to see a really great example of this, uh, I would highly recommend checking out, uh, again, this is, Trying to remember some stream, some some stuff that uh, I saw long ago, but 
there's a great s uh, scene where uh, Alto, getting the Alto running again. Uh, let's hit this. So I don't know if this is, oh, oh god, the browser has crashed, ladies and gentlemen, it's all over. Well, I was trying to show you. Um, I don't know if this is the one, this might not be the one, because uh, there was a YouTube, th this looks like the one though, I don't know where the YouTube video is, they have a video of it. Um, but this is a pretty uh, fun one that's sort of an easier problem. It's much older hardware, so it's easier to analyze. Uh, but it's really fun to watch them. If you watch them trying to get this old uh, Alto, obviously the Alto is a computer that from very, very, very long ago. Uh, it was from Xerox Park, the people who basically invented the graphical user interface. Um, it was their uh, machine that they created. <clears throat> And there are still some that still work in existence. Uh, and someone was trying to take one and restore it to working order. And of course, that can be hard because chips can fail. Uh, things can corrode. Contacts get old. Uh, components burn out. And you have to refurbish them. And so one of the things that you see a lot when they do this is they put a lot of uh, logic analyzer probes on various pins. And then they have hardware uh, that they can record all of the information going across those pins and reverse engineer what's going wrong. And it's really cool to watch. Uh, and so that is kind of the way in which those sorts of things happen if you can't run on the machine and you need to analyze it. Uh, it's really cool. Storing tours. I'm not sure if anyone has mentioned this, but in the cutscene shot six, layer three and four are both at z equals three. Layer three should be at 3.01 instead. Layer four is the child's tears, and layer three is the child. Um, can you, uh, do you want to, well, I was going to say, we probably don't want to deal with that right now, um, but I could uh, try to put an issue in for that. Um. Um, I guess the first thing I would ask the snoring tortoise is why do you think that's a problem? That they're equaled.
like uh, Storming Tortoise, can, is, is there a particular bug that you're seeing? Ah, the tears are behind the child, so you can't see them. So we should be able to just swap the order in which they're drawn then, though, right? Um, as well. Uh, but there we go. That way, when we're cleaning out GitHub's uh, later on, we can we can take a look at that. All right. Uh, oh, Desu's got a question just at the end here. Uh, will the order of matrix multiplication be reversed if we use transposed matrices and vectors? Uh, so I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Um, uh, but I guess you're saying, will the conceptual order, if that makes sense? Uh, and so uh, let, let me just draw this out, and I'll see if I'm answering the question that you're talking about. I might not be. Because uh, I'm not sure I totally understand what you're asking. But um, so what you can see in this case, right, is you've got AC, uh, BD are, are the vectors here, right? Uh, so in the case where you're doing this transform, uh, you end up with x times AC uh, plus y times BD, right? And this is the standard picture. And now you're asking if you used everything transposed, I think is what you're saying. Um, so if everything was transposed, then what ends up happening is you can see uh, that you run into a problem right away in terms of the order, uh, which I, I'm assuming is kind of what you're getting at. Uh, but if this was transformed, right, transposed, it would be uh, like so. And of course, uh, straight ahead matrix multiplication of the form that we're doing doesn't work. Uh, when you have the wrong number of rows, if the, if the number of rows of this doesn't match the number of columns of this, which in this case it doesn't, right? There's a missing uh, row that we would need to form our products. So we can't do that, and we pretty much have to uh, do it this way, right? And when we do it this way, uh, what we see from our result, right, uh, is that when we do our multiplication, in this case, um, we get ABXY, so AX plus BY, uh, as the first term of our vector and the second term of our vector. Uh, oops, that's an A, B. Uh, and the second term of our vector is CX uh, plus DY, right? Um, and so you can see in this case, in terms of, of uh, what we're producing, it's actually still the same uh, product, in a sense, because you can see what the x's uh, are multiplying. They're multiplying AC. So it's still x AC uh, plus y uh, BD, uh, which is the same thing, right? Uh, so I don't know if this is what you were trying to get at, but your intuition is correct that the reading of something multiplied in this order with column vectors is the same as the reading of it in the opposite order using row vectors, because as you can see, the row vector ends up on the other side of the matrix, right? And so if you were to string them all together, uh, you would get the opposite order depending on which way you go. Uh, was that what you were asking? Disused, disused. Just 
just want to know if that answers the question. Uh, that's what I was asking earlier. OK. Uh, yes, it's worth noting also that uh, I think some people do do it that way. Um, math is pretty explicit about this sort of thing. And I wish pseudonym 73 were here. He's not. Um, as you know, he's the, uh, you know, he's the expert on those sorts of things. but. Uh, what I would point out is, is typically in math notation, if you write something like this, um, this is different. Um, conceptually, um, so if you write something as a column vector, people typically consider this to be different than if you write as a row vector. Um, they're, they're actually mathematically different for obvious reasons, like we just sort of showed what way they are, uh, what way they end up getting multiplied by matrices and on which side they are. Uh, and there's these things called covariant and contravariant vectors. Um, <clears throat> You can see here. Uh, and covariant and contravariant vectors are often written um, in those opposite ways. So oftentimes, like you can see here, uh, you, you got a row vector for a, a, a covariant and, and a column vector for a contravariant. Um, <clears throat> however, math people decided to do it. Um, because that's the way they chose to organize the things originally, right? And then that's how the math works out. I don't go down the math road very far. As you know, uh, I am not a mathematician. I'm a programmer. Uh, and I know a bunch of math because I have to know it uh, to do my job. But I'm, I'm not excellent at it. I am not a math person. Uh, there's a lot of programmers uh, who are much better at math than I am. And so I won't try to give you some kind of an opinion about whether it's more appropriate to write the equations we're writing. Uh, as column vectors or not. I simply go with the convention that most uh, well-respected math programmers that I know choose to write their points as column vectors and things like um, normals or other kinds of byproduct vectors are written as rows, and so I do as well. But I am not the kind of uh, saucy math person who really can claim to have their own opinion about something like that because I'm just not deep enough into uh, you know, tensor mathematics or geometric algebra or any of these other sorts of things, where you know, if you were a real expert in those things, you probably have strong opinions about these sorts of uh, decisions and how they go. And uh, so if you're somebody who feels like you want to know more about that, I would highly recommend maybe digging deeper into the literature there and going, finding some more mathematically minded people who um, write about this sort of thing. Uh, so that you can form your own opinion about it. Uh, don't listen to me on anything like that. All right, folks. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I will close all this down. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another sort of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along at home, of course, you can always pre order the game. It does come with the source code, uh, and that's on handmadehero.org. Also, there's a bunch of helpful links there. You can go to the forums. Uh, which you saw on today's stream, actually, um, that the Handmade Network folks do. Uh, it's a great place to ask questions if you've got questions. We have a Patreon page for us to support the video series. We have a schedule bot. If you want to know when the series is live, it will tweet the schedule every weekend. Uh, and we've got an episode guide if you're trying to catch up with old episodes. 
That's about it for today. I'll be back here tomorrow, 10 a.m., same time, same place. Hope to see everyone there for that. Uh, until then, have fun programming. I'll see you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.